Appreciate you streaming in here on Birds 365. We've got the big game coming up against the Chiefs on Monday night here to give us a Kansas City perspective from the Chiefs Zone podcast is our next guest who's going to pronounce his own name for us so we don't mm-hmm. watch it when we uh, uh, say hello to him. Farzin, Farzin, Soft G, Hard G, Vesugian, Vesugian. How are we doing this? Farzin, Vesugian. Nice. Farzin, Vesugian. All right. Hard G and Farzine. Thank you very much for hopping in, Farzine. Um, Absolutely. Here's where I want to go first with you, and I bet you didn't expect this question because I follow you on Twitter. You're also associated with uh, SeatGeek. How yes. many Eagle fans have gotten tickets for this game? We like to brag here in Philadelphia that we're one of the best traveling fan bases on the planet, but Kansas City is a damn good home field advantage. They don't give their tickets up easily. Uh, following your seat geek uh, info, how how green can this crowd get on Sunday at Arrowhead? Yeah, I can't say I'm uh, I'm too familiar with the um, w- w- with those uh, insights there, but I, I will say this: uh, I was at Arrowhead for the uh, season opener against the Detroit Lions, and uh, there was a there was a lot of blue there. Uh, and I know there's been a lot of hype uh, surrounding the Detroit Lions this year. So uh, obviously, the Eagles, you know, much better football team. Although I think Detroit's not too far this season uh i mean they're up there as one of the best uh but uh i i think you know given how good the season uh the eagles are having best record in the nfl right now i think uh you can definitely expect some uh some green in the cra- it, it, you're gonna see some uh some christmas colors in the uh, in the stands yeah green and red a lot of red though yeah uh <laughs> there's gonna be more red it's not gonna be a takeover situation can't do that in kansas city those detroit bands parsing are are they're underrated man we uh, I went there last year. They were they were fired up to play the Eagles. They've been so desperate for a winner. I guess they're pretty psyched up. But uh, mm-hmm. and they have a very good team. But obviously, uh, rematch of Super Bowl Fifty Seven. We'll focus it on that. You know, I think these two teams are unique because they're in similar situations. They're both number one in the conference again. Um, and I think both fan bases. I know the Eagles fan base. They're like. Oh, the Eagles are eight and one, but and they want the style points. Are the Chiefs getting that in Kansas City? They're seven and two, but they don't look like the Chiefs normally look. Are they getting that? No, 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 no. Wow. It's been a it's been a big topic of conversation. I think you know, and if, for anyone who saw the Week One game against Detroit, um, it was it was not pretty uh, on offense. Um, and uh, you know, it had nothing to do with Travis Kelsey being unavailable for that game. Just drop passes. One of them, uh, yeah, Kadarius Tony, still Kadarius dropping Tony, passes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for a pick six. Um, and it's not just him. I mean, every week it's someone else. I mean, it's a wide receiver that's dropping or fumbling on offense or on special teams. And it's kind of frustrating. It's been very tough to watch this season Um, because Kansas City's done a really good job of moving the football on offense, but red zone offense has not been very good this year. And in certain situations, especially crucial late in game situations, those drops have uh, definitely been drive killers for Kansas City. And uh, that's forced them to kind of be backed up against the wall and uh, do some things that they don't expect to do normally in those situations. Um, I I think the, the, the thing that, you know, a lot of because I was looking at the uh, MVP race recently, and Patrick Mahomes is still up there, and a lot of these betting favorites. Um, sure, some of that might be projection and whatnot, but uh, you know, I, I'll say this: in 2021, the Chiefs' offense got off to a very slow start, and they 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 were far worse that year. They started three and four, and some people out there did write them off. And if you look at so, and I was actually studying some of the game film recently from that year, you're kind of seeing some of the similar issues today. Uh, where Patrick Mahomes has some wide open players and is not getting the ball to them. He's been missing some guys wide open, not getting the ball to them. And uh, I, I think if he trusts those receivers a little bit more, um, you'll start seeing a more dynamic offense. It's not going to be like, you know, having Tyreek Hill and Sammy Watkins, that kind of style of offense, but enough to be able to move the ball and uh, start scoring more points because that's definitely been an issue for the Chiefs this year. Farzine, John and I were just talking about this, that the Eagles running game hasn't been as good this year as it was last year. And we agree that the main reason is Jalen Hurts is just not a running factor. He's either been dictated to by the organization. Listen, you're a $250 million guy. You can't be putting yourself at risk or the last three or four weeks. He's had a legit uh, knee injury that he's been dealing with, but uh, his inability or uh, the team's decision to not have him part of the running game has hurt everybody else. 
Patrick Mahomes is one of the better under the radar make a play with his legs quarterbacks in the league. Made a pretty big one in the biggest game of the year last year at the end of the season, too, by the way. And I don't think Eagle fans have forgotten that. Am I overstating that? Or could that be a factor in this Monday night game that Patrick Mahomes, if the Eagle rush comes flying in and he steps up and the field is open, do you think he'll take off and can he make a 20-plus uh, yard play with his legs? Yeah, he's certainly got a chance. I know Andy Reid, the way he designed some of these schemes here, uh, he, he'll try to put Patrick Mahomes in situations where, you know, there, there's always a plan in, in what to do, uh, who to get the ball to. But if that plan's not there, go to plan B, go to plan C, you know, look at your second, third reads, whatever. Uh, but if those are not there either, and if there is a wide open lane, yeah, you got to take it. And Patrick Mahomes is certainly capable of uh, getting those uh, big plays there. You did, did mention uh, what he did in the Super Bowl uh, late in the game. Uh, to try to help the Chiefs get closer to the end zone and eventually got that game-winning field goal. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's more of a, you know, plan, one of the lower-tier plans, um, because the Chiefs' offense, they want to get the passing game going, uh, you know, try to eliminate the drops, try to get into the end zone more, because they haven't been doing a lot of that. The defense has been really the MVP, the uh, the first nine games for the Chiefs. And look, uh, I, I know a lot of people try to use that against uh, Patrick Mahomes' case and all, which I understand. I mean, he's not having a superb season, but... Uh, Patrick Mahomes has carried this defense for so many years. His first year starting, the defense was ranked uh, 31st in the NFL, and they were essentially an offsides away from a Super Bowl, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people remember. So, um, you know, now it's the other way around. But Patrick Mahomes, uh, after the Chiefs beat the Dolphins in Germany, he did an interview with Peter King, I believe it was. Um, and uh, he said that, you know, hey, promise you, we're going to get this offense going. We're going to get it fixed. Our defense is playing well. They've been playing lights out. And uh, we got to start matching that level of play. And uh, we'll get that taken care of. And I think, you know, going back to two years ago, when I mentioned the slow starts and the struggles that year, they eventually got going. They eventually got going. And so uh, do you have Tyreek Hill, Juju Smith-Schuster? No, those guys are gone, obviously. But at the end of the day, uh, Patrick Mahomes is just not a guy you can ever count out. And, um, you know, Andy Reid as your head coach, Travis Kelsey, of course, doing his thing. Uh, you can definitely expect the the offense to start to improve in the second half of the season. Yeah, you mentioned a, a little bit there, Barzine, that the shift in sort of mentality. Anytime you think about Andy Reid, and certainly since Patrick has gotten there, those two teamed up, you think offense and you think how great that Kansas City offense has been. And this year it's been – the defense that's been the better of the two groups. And in the past, it's been, all right, if Spax can get to third down, third and long, he's going to, you know, unfurl some unique stuff and make it really difficult. They would tend to get better in the second half of the season. They're just flat out good on defense this year. Everything. Uh, what what has changed for the Chiefs? Where Why, what, how, why have they turned the corner on that side of the football? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I think the secondary has really been impressive. Um, you look at some of the young guys they drafted last year, and I'll say this right now, going into last year, that was a big concern of mine because the Chiefs had very little veteran experience at that cornerback position. Guys they drafted last year, such as Jalen Watson, uh, Nazi Johnson, who unfortunately uh, unable to play this year due to injury, Josh Williams, their first-round pick, Trent McDuffie, who's been playing very good football this year. These are not guys who thrive statistically, um, but they're really doing under the radar type of things in that secondary to kind of shut it down. Um, the, the, the way that this secondary has played, especially at the quarterback position and then the safeties, uh, Justin Reed, who I think is an underrated safety, very underappreciated, even here in Kansas city, I would argue, um, uh, he's been playing very good cover football. Uh, and I think that's been very important, especially in this past heavy league teams love to, to pass the football far more than they did 15, 20 years ago. So you start seeing that more, uh, more often. And the chiefs are just not allowing a lot of that. I think the, the most telling game so far this year, outside of that Miami dolphins game would have to be the chargers game where, uh, the chargers did score 17 points in the first half and then scored nothing in the second half. Yeah. The chargers got into the red zone, but they were able to come through with, um, with a red zone tur turnover and didn't let the chargers get close to the end zone ever again, the rest of the game and Kansas city was able to get one score in the second half, which, you know, we talked about the inconsistencies on offense. It's all they needed to try to uh, put the game away. So that defense, that secondary has been great. Uh, Legereus need uh, has yet to allow a touchdown this year. Uh, Trent McDuffie, I mentioned he leads the uh, NFL among all defensive backs and forced fumbles. Uh, the one he had two weeks ago got a lot of attention because it was against Tyree kill uh, his first game against the chiefs. 
uh, since being traded. And then um, the, the defensive front, Chris Jones. Uh, I, I mean, I don't need to get into it. Everyone knows about Chris Jones and what he's doing. George Karloftis making that second year leap. He's been very good. The surprise on that defense would have to be Mike Dana um, at the defensive end opposite of Karloftis. Uh, he, he did a good job filling in for Charles Aminahu during his 6 a.m. suspension. And the linebackers, Drew Tranquil coming in from uh, from the Chargers. Uh, he's been uh, a very pleasant surprise. I, I, I shouldn't say a uh, surprise, but he certainly stepped up in Nick Bolton's absence, uh, which a lot of people were concerned about. Um, sure. This defense has just been great all over, which has been uh, fun to watch for the Chiefs fans this year. I, one of the categories that the Chiefs lead the league in in offense, and it's not all that many this year, which is kind of puzzling to say with Patrick Mahomes at the quarterback, but it's the truth, is they're the least sacked team in the NFL. Mahomes has only been sacked 12 times this year. Who gets credit for that? The offensive line, Mahomes, Andy Reid, and or Matt Nagy in his system, only be sacked 12 times in nine games they're doing something right what is it you, you know the chiefs do have a good interior offensive line their offensive tackles you know i, I wouldn't say they're um they, they, they have been great uh statistically i saw a stat out, out there um and i don't know where it came from but i just saw a screenshot of it where uh the offensive tackles have a win uh a blocking percentage of 90 percent or above which was a little bit of a surprise to me um Jawan taylor I know he, he's got a lot of attention early this year because of the way he lined up and whatnot. Um, but he seems to have figured it out, even though he's doing the same thing. He's not getting penalized for it anymore. <laughs> um, but he's he's had a good uh, win uh, blocking percentage there. Um, Donovan Smith, the newcomer, filling in for Orlando Brown, who's now with Cincinnati. Chiefs let him walk because Orlando Brown led the NFL in QB pressures allowed last year, which still, you know, Mahomes found a way to to uh, avoid getting sacked so much. Um, and I think, you know, uh, to, to answer your question, I think some of that is really on Mahomes. He has really great awareness, uh, almost like, you know, obviously no one has eyes in the back of their heads, but Patrick Mahomes might have eyes in the back of his heads because whenever he feels a, a defender coming around and being an offensive tackle, he seems to just have that feel and is really aware of where people are at, at certain times and knows when to run uh, out of the pocket. I know some people bring that up uh, as a case against him, but, um, you know, better to get out, escape the pocket oh, and yeah. try to attend plays. Um, and he's been able to do to, to do that sometimes whenever offensive tackles get beat. It's actually been a story here, Parzine in Philadelphia as well, but the turnovers, typically when you're a very good team, um, you have a good turnover ratio. The Eagles are underwater. Um, the Chiefs are even farther underwater at minus four on the season. Um Typically, as I said, that's not the case for winning teams. Uh, have the Chiefs been able to overcome that? And are, is Andy really focused in on on turning that around in the second half? Yeah, I mean, to, to answer your second question, you have to. I mean, if you're a coach, that's definitely something you got to address. Um, and unfortunately, the Chiefs, um, and not just turnovers, too, uh, the drops, and I know we alluded to that already, um, those two things together uh, are just not good. So to, at, at the very least, e even have the number one seed for now in the AFC, I mean, you got to feel pretty fortunate because turnovers and drops, um, that is a bad marriage. <laughs> very bad marriage, to say the least. Um, but how do they survive? I, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but that defense really has carried the Chiefs, especially in the second half of games this year. Um, the inconsistencies with the offense has been very frustrating because that's not something we're used to. Uh, when you have Andy Reid as your offensive guru and you have Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, uh, a very good interior offensive line, um, the wide receivers were still kind of waiting for someone to have that breakout game Um uh, Sky Moore, you know, I, I think the uh, window of opportunity for him is closing. Uh, he has not really made the most of his opportunities. Um, uh, I, I think uh, Rasheed Rice has really picked it up, but even then, he's had his uh, struggles with drops and uh, and uh, route running. Uh, Justin Ross, uh, you know, even when he got an opportunity, he was dropping passes, and right now he's dealing with a legal matter. He's on the commissioner's exempt list, so we're not going to see him uh, anytime soon. So. Um, the Chiefs are still kind of waiting uh, for, for that offense to pick up. And, um, you know, I, at the end of the day, I'll stick to what I said. I think if, if you have uh, those guys, Mahomes, Kelsey, Reed, you trust that at some point they're going to pick this up, especially with the playoff race heating up right now. All right. Uh, it's become a pretty big story here in Philadelphia. It's become a pretty big story nationally. How big a story is Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift 
in Kansas City? How is it playing there as compared to everywhere else? Because it is as big a story as it is. Is it all positive in Kansas City? Are some people questioning him going to South America on his bye week to go hang in the concert and her rewriting the words to her song to include <laughs> her new boyfriend in it? How big a story in KC is it? Uh, it's it's a huge deal. Um, uh, I, I don't uh, for any baseball fans. I remember uh, when the Royals. Uh, the Royals are historically a, a bad team, but I remember in 2014. Um, or 2015, excuse me, Eric Hosmer, the uh, former Royals first baseman, um, he started dating a uh, model who was previously engaged to Aaron Murray, who was drafted by the Chiefs. Yeah, and she used to she, work here in Philly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you, guys, you guys know her very well. Um, Bill Nova. I, uh, what's her name? Oh, Dan, I can't remember. And I know her. When, uh, <laughs> yeah, Casey McDonald um, yeah, yeah, and, and Eric Hosmer. Uh, yeah. I think they were in San Francisco for a weekend, and they took pictures together, and that was the number one story on the Kansas City Stars website. Um, so, you know, this isn't, you know, L.A. or a TMZ type of city, but uh, those uh, we're not used to those kinds of things. So yeah. for the hottest uh, singer to, you know, be dating – Travis Kelsey, who's had a really a phenomenal 12 months with the Super Bowl win, Saturday Night Live, the podcast with his brother, which obviously you guys know uh, well, uh, very well uh, of just as much as we are. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he's had quite the uh, 12 months. Uh, it, it, there are some people who are annoyed with it. And it's funny because, you know, I, I run a Facebook page, a lot of it dedicated to Chiefs talk. Uh, whenever I post about Taylor Swift, there are a lot of people who complain, hey, let's let's stick, stick to, football, to football. But but there it's it's honestly the the um the topic that gets the most engagement i i posted oh, yeah. a picture of um of taylor swift and ed kelsey uh travis and jason's father uh, i mean it blew up like it's like it, it's just a picture of them like you hanging out after a game i think so um it's a huge deal i guess um it's it, it's weird to have the biggest name in music to be dating a Kansas City Chiefs player. We're still not really used to the fact that this team is getting the coverage it's getting, and now even more so because of Taylor Swift. Um, if you told me this 10, 15 years ago, I would have said you're insane. There's, there's no way that would ever happen here in Kansas City. Of now, I, I have a different question in that same vein with Taylor and Travis. Now, I think a lot of fans, and I know a lot of fans, don't know you have to give the players time off during the bye week. You have to give them four consecutive days off. You have to have, they have to be over the weekend at least. Um, and when you're good, it's really hard to play hard ass um, and say, you got to be back in the facility as quickly as possible. And both the chiefs and Eagles are obviously very good. Um, are there people, if the chiefs lose that say, Taylor Swift is killing the 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 cheap season because I'm sure there is. I'm I'm sure they're knuckleheads in that uh, vein. I mean the the stats prove otherwise. I don't have it in front of me, but when Taylor Swift is not in attendance, Travis Kelsey has a really quiet game. A bad game. Oh, he's, in, yeah, he's trying to show off. I see. It, yeah. yeah. When when she's there, I mean he's playing lights out. Um, in fact, in the uh, game against the Chargers, uh, he was very close. I mean, he was on pace at one point to break the uh, single game record for most receiving yards by a tight end. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I mean, listen, I don't know. These guys have lives. Um, they do have I, lives. Shocking. I mean, and they don't all uh, get talked about as much. I know uh, one. Uh, so former Chiefs kicker Nick Lowry, uh, he was out there on social media making a big deal about the Broncos loss and kind of pinning part of that on Travis Kelsey traveling on a Friday night to game one of the World Series in Texas. And he, listen, you know, Travis Kelsey, he's up there in the celebrity level. So he's obviously on a charter flight and can go anywhere within a moment's notice. So it's not like, he, you know, he's waiting the next day for a Southwest or American yeah, Airlines yeah, flight or anything. Yeah. But um, I, I, I don't know what to make of that stuff. I, I, I really don't. It's their time off. It's their week off. I know uh, one of the more uh, famous incidents, and I'm sure uh, Eagles fans chuckle about this one, was when. The Giants players, uh, not even on a bye week uh, for a playoff game on a oh, Monday yeah. night. Oh yeah, they traveled and you know came back late Tuesday, and people blame that for their playoff loss. So you know, um, uh, I, I don't know. Travis Kelsey's a part of here. He's always been that guy. We've known that for a very long time. So um, I mean, until uh, we, we can start seeing evidence that it's impacting the field, it's really not too big of a story here in Kansas City. All right, Farzine, I want to get a read on the Chiefs' running game. 
Dan and I were just talking about it before you came on that people here in Philadelphia are wondering why the Eagles aren't running the ball as effectively as they did last year. John and I have a simple answer. Jalen Hurts just isn't running the ball as well as he did last year, and it has a residual effect on everybody else. Uh, last year in the Super Bowl, uh, Mr. Pacheco, the former Rutgers guy, local yeah. guy, uh, was a pretty key contributor to the Chiefs being able to win that game. How has he played this year as compared to last? Are they doing anything else in the rushing game? Is it all him? Uh, Clyde edwards helaire has been a disappointment for me. I thought he was going to be a real nice player when he came out yeah. of the draft from LSU. Hasn't really done that in the NFL. How is the Chiefs running game coming into this matchup with the Eagles? Chiefs running game, you know, I mean, if you just want to look at stats, uh, I know they're uh, below league average there, but I, uh, people here love Isaiah Pacheco. He has played really good football. Um, uh, I mean, this guy almost went undrafted and really has been that spark that Kansas City needed at the uh, backfield. Uh, you know, which is interesting because this is always going to be a pass first team. Um, and Isaiah Pacheco, as good of a running back as he is, but a very tough physical running back, too, not afraid of contact. Yep. The one big complaint everybody has is why in the hell do the Chiefs not run the ball on third and one? And, and not just, you know, not running the ball, the, the plays they design that don't even make sense in third and short yardage situations. So, for example, against the uh, Miami Dolphins, you know, you just need a yard to pick up to, uh, potentially put the game away and not give Miami an opportunity. Andy Reid calls a pass play and Mahomes is throwing the ball out of bounds. So not only do you not run the ball, but you stop the clock and you essentially take a timeout for the, uh, for the dolphins and give them a, a, a ample time to really try to put together a, a, a comfortable drive down the field. So I, I, I think that's really not a complaint about Isaiah Pacheco, but Man, it's just, you know, run the ball a little more because whenever the Chiefs do that, you do see good things happen. And I'll throw Jarek McKinnon's name in there. I know you mentioned CEH, but Jarek McKinnon really came alive late last year. He won um, AFC Offensive Player of the Month, the last player to do that in the regular season. And um, he's always, he's looked really good the last two years late in the seasons. Um, the Chiefs are really saving him for the second half of the seasons because that's when they really get the most out of him, especially in the passing game. So, I was going to say, uh, he's an out-of-the-backfield guy. How many times yeah. is What's the average like? Less than two runs per game. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he. Whenever he runs the ball, we don't see a lot of that. Even last year, I think the Chiefs like to use him more in the passing department, and far more than the rushing. They Isaiah Pacheco has really handled a lot of the uh, the rushing duties. But uh, I think uh, with the second half of the season coming up for uh, for both teams, I think you'll expect to see the Chiefs to uh, start to use Jarek McKinnon more. Would it surprise me if he was uh, a big part of the the game plan Monday Night Football? Yeah, Andy in the running game. We've heard that uh, a time or two here in Philadelphia. If yeah, if, if Andy's got his dr uh, a druther, he's going to throw the football. But I will say it's a bye week, so we also know about Andy Reid coming off a bye, thirteen and one yep. here in Philadelphia. I think he's eight and two in Kansas City. Um, did he let you guys in on his secret? Why he's so good coming off uh, coming off a bye? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, we, we we don't really uh, have the um, the uh, machinations as to how that all works out. Um, I, if I had to take a guess, I, I think a lot of it is really just the way he studies the game and tries to draw up certain plays. Not that other coaches don't do that. Of course they do. Uh, but I think with Andy Reid and, uh, you, you know, you didn't see it with Matt Nagy in Chicago. You saw some of it with Doug Peterson in Philadelphia and now in Jacksonville, although Jacksonville has kind of struggled uh, in the past few games. Um, Andy Reid's just really done a really good job of utilizing uh, certain things. Now, the complaint is um, some games are way too close for comfort, uh, which, uh, you know, games that, you know, should be blowouts tend to be closer games and then games that should be closer tend to be sometimes uh, blowouts when you least expect it on Kansas City side. So I don't know. I mean, uh, for all we know, um, uh, this could be a one-sided game and that would be a surprise to us. So uh, Andy Reid's always got his secrets. He never reveals them. Um, he's a very, you know, is, uh, do more, say less type of guy. And you guys obviously know a lot about that during his time in Philadelphia. All right. Uh, last one for me, far as in, um, we all know what happened in February last year, that the Eagles were winning the game, had control of the game, gave up control of the game yeah. to walk in touchdowns and a Harrison Butker field goal with 10 seconds to go made Kansas City the Chiefs of the National Football League. How much do they rely on that tape of that game to try and reproduce the uh, outcome? 
Is it now the 2023 Eagles against 2023 Chiefs and last year's Super Bowl is ancient history? Or do they use that? Do they have that as a tool to go, hey, here's what we did. Here's what worked. Here's what we could reproduce. How much do you think last year's Super Bowl aids the Chiefs in preparing for this game this week? I think the, I mean, if you're going to study the first, uh, the the uh, the tape, you got to look at the first half of that game if you're Kansas City because the Chiefs only put one offensive score in uh, in that one. Um, and obviously, I know Patrick got hurt uh, late in that first half, re-aggravated that ankle injury, but really came alive in the second half where they scored on every drive. And I know uh, you guys were talking a little bit about that earlier um, with, um, you know, not being lined up correctly, but they still got that score to work out uh, close to the end zone. Uh, you got to study that first half and fi- f- figure out why were things not working early on and why the Eagles had a 10 point lead at halftime and try to figure all of that out, find the secret recipe, f- see what worked, what didn't work and try to apply that um, because you can't afford a slow start anymore. You're, you, I mean, the schedule is getting tougher for the chiefs um, starting with Monday night against Eagles. So uh, it's important for this offense to get off to a, a much better start um, compared to how they played in Super Bowl 57, as well as some of the games this year where the uh, offense has really stalled in, uh, in a lot of their drives. And I think, um, you know, um, I think a lot of people, even in Kansas City, might be surprised if you start to see the yeah. offense pick it up, especially against a good Eagles team. But this is the week where it's really got to start to 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 be put together and uh, start happening, make things happen. Yeah, I I would study the second half, Barzine. Just keep doing that. Uh, <laughs> that's the way I'd go about it. At Barzine twenty one, uh, make sure you follow uh, Barzine Basugian. Hopefully, I got that right. On you did. X, uh, Twitter. Does a tremendous job covering the Chiefs, uh, one of the best teams in football. And, yeah, you know, I've talked about this a lot. It, it, obviously, it's a big game because it's Super Bowl 57 rematch. Yeah. But if you're being honest, Farzine, all right, if the Chiefs lose, it's an NFC team. If the Eagles lose, it's an AFC team. Tiebreakers, you always want to win a game because you want to be the number one seed. Both teams have to keep going in a positive direction. But this is not a devastating loss for either. Do you get that feel from the Kansas City side? I think it would just depend on what happens. I mean, if the offense plays like like if this is like a 45-42 game, I think a lot of people are going to say, hey, the offense had their best game of the year. Great. But all of a sudden, when the offense finally steps up, the defense kind of falls apart. So it's really hard to answer that question. I I mean, I, I, I don't know. How to uh, how, what would have to happen to my, maybe feel like this would be uh, a moral victory, which you know I, I think uh, n- neither fan base really uh, wants that. And I mean that's obviously not the standard. Um, to me, y- you know, when it's you know mid to late November, this is where things really start to heat up, and one loss can feel like a huge deal. Um, what's the gap in the NFC between one and two right now? Well, just one, one game. game. One game. Lions you know. are one Seven game behind. Two. Yeah, yeah, because uh, you know Thursday night, um, the Ravens are. are uh, it's been a it's been a long week for me yeah. tonight, I should say. Um, the Ravens do have a chance to uh, move ahead in the standings uh, for a few days. Um, so you know it's going to be a really tight race down the stretch. Um, Kansas City's been in this situation before, where they're always competing for a number one seed or a number two seed. Back when you know the number two seed had more value. Um, with a bye week. Um, so they've been in this position so many times. And uh, listen, it's a huge deal. The fact that the Chiefs have hosted the AFC title game five years in a row because they never did before. And they really want it to happen again uh, with this team. It's going to be much harder because the offense is not there, but they have the number number one seed right now. So, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of standings watching for sure. And um, every game is going to be crucial from here on out, especially with the difficult schedule. So I think the offense definitely wants to make a statement in this one for sure from Kansas City side. All right, Farzine, I would say that Patrick Mahomes over the course of his career, which is still in the young stages, if he's going to be a guy who's going to stick around for 15 years, which I think he will, um, has exhibited the clutch gene. I bring this up from time to time, either here on my uh, radio shows, that you can't teach the clutch gene. Either you have it or you don't have it. And I think that Patrick Mahomes does. What what can the Eagles do, if anything, 
to try and fight off the clutch gene of Patrick Mahomes. He did it last year with a little help from a referee and a call and a hold. All right, we won't go there. Um, but what, what can the Eagles do, if anything, to try and keep Patrick Mahomes from winning this game in the final two minutes? I think uh, I think you got to pressure him. I mean, you, you, you contain him. Don't let him escape the pocket. Don't give him the uh, the big things, the, the the big plays out there. Um, essentially, you know, everything's got to work on defense. Um, and I think the Eagles do have uh, some of that uh, equipped in their uh, our defensive arsenal right there with, with those guys up front. Um, I, you know, people still talk about the fact that Jalen Carter, like how the hell does he end up in Philadelphia? I, I don't know. I've Everybody been about it for months. That the <laughs> NFL should be ashamed of themselves. As far as <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it's, uh, the Eagles, I think, you know, they're as good of a team as any to, uh, to try to, um, to try to nullify some of those things that Patrick Mahomes is capable of. They, I, I think they did some of that in the first half, which is, you know, why I was saying the chiefs need to study that and try to figure out how to, um, how to improve on some of those things. Uh, and I will say this, I think for both teams, this line of scrimmage battle is going to be a big one for both of them. Um, I think Kansas city's offensive line, um, it's going to be the best the Eagles have seen all year. And I think the Eagles defensive front is going to be the best the chiefs have seen all year. And the same thing, uh, on the other side of the football. Um, so I think that line of scrimmage battle is going to be a lot of fun to watch. If, if you're one of those, like, you know, pro football focus, got a fantasy football betting lines. Like if you're into all of that stuff, the X's and O's, I think that line of scrimmage battle is going to be a lot of fun to watch on both sides of the ball for this team or for this game, I should say. Farzine, great uh, having you join us. We appreciate it. Check out his podcast, Chief Zone, where you get your better podcasts. You're taking a little bit of a heat here on the uh, stream for wearing the Kansas City garb, but hey, swag is swag is swag. <laughs> More power to you, buddy. Appreciate you jumping in with us today. Enjoy the game on Monday night. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks for having me. Take care. That is Thanks, Farzine. Farzine. Yeah. I, I would never, by the way, I don't own – Anything Eagles related, a lot of fans on the stream saying, would you ever wear? No, I would not. I got uh, but, an Eagles you know, hat. I never put it on. I, not, I don't. Not on a show. I don't own anything Eagles. I'm not an Eagles fan. I'm an Eagles reporter. But I'm an old school guy. Things have changed many, you know, there, there are certain, you know, my goal is to be objective. So, no. I've been asked at radio spots, live radio spots, put on an Eagles jersey. I will not do it. I will not. I will never wear yeah. anything Eagles. Never, never for any NFL team. That's not I, how I would. I would for one reason and one reason only. If I was asked, I wouldn't choose to bring my own Eagle gear no. and put it in. But I, if I, I were go a, one hey, step can you further. Put an Eagle no. jersey on. No. Take Absolutely a picture. Not. Yeah, sure. Why In not? Fact, as long as Joe, we Joe, ahead of time, it's you're making a request no, for me to do it, no, then I'll do I it, do it. Eh, out of a favor for you. But I'm not bringing in my own stuff. That's not happening. No, I can't do it. I cannot do it. Joe Kraus has asked me to do it at live remotes. So really? I cannot do it. I tell him, I can't look. I can't do it. I can't. That's it's not part of the job. I mean, now, but things have changed so much. There's a lot of people that do that, and yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it's not, shouldn't be that way. But I, now I, I'm I being get it. off my as, lawn, as long, guy. And then I'm not wearing it home and wearing it out or whatever. Here, you want me to put the jersey? I'll put it on, take a couple pictures. And Here, you, I, you know, back. it's funny. I'm not keeping it. When it's I funny. Put it on for a photo op. What the hell? I love it because I, I got. I think John's a 49ers fan. You're 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 making my day when you say stuff like this because I get this all the time. I'm a 49ers fan. I'm a Bears fan. I used to cover the Vikings. I'm a Vikings fan. I'm a this fan. I'm a that fan. The more teams you say, the better it is for me because you have no freaking idea, and that's the way it should be because I'm not a fan. That's the point. It doesn't upset me when the Eagles win. It doesn't upset me when they lose. I'm sorry, but that's, you know, it's the way it is. Oh, I, I, yeah, you, you're an actual reporter. I'm not, I'm a, I'm a host. And for me, you, you do two different jobs. Uh, mine is more narrow than yours because you've got an actual job as a reporter. You have to hold yourself to certain standards. I don't feel that I need to do that. And I'll readily admit that I'm a fan. I'm a Jet fan first. The Eagles are my favorite NFC team. But when I come on the air here, 
I tried this, and I know that I've got a couple of guys. My buddy Dominique is going to jump out and tell me that I'm lying through my teeth. But I'm telling the honest to God truth. I'm looking right into the camera. Every time I do a show, I try and put my rooting interests aside. I don't wear my rooting interests on the sleeve when I'm hosting a show. Off the air, yes. If I'm going to try and make a point and I'm going to go, listen, this comes from Jody Mac, the fan, then I'll say that. But I do not allow my uh, rooting interest to affect the way I do a show, be it on the radio or here on Birds 365. That I don't do. That I'm kind of like you, that I have certain standards that I'm going to keep and I don't compromise them. Uh, there's some of the people on the stream here call me a hater because I don't take out the pom-poms and wave the eagle pom-coms the way that they, I guess, want me to. That's not happening. That's not the way I do this show. But you want me to yeah, throw an eagle pom -pom, jersey out well, for a photo I, you know, I, Come I, on, I I'll put an eagle jersey on tomorrow for You know, some people think I hate the eagles. Some people think I love the eagles. I get, oh, you work for the team when I say something positive. Uh, when I say something negative, you're a hater. You're just, that's the one thing that makes me happy because then you know you're doing your job right. That's, uh, John, I, I I hold you in pretty damn high esteem because of the way that you do your job, both uh, writing for SI and Jacob Sports and also here on Burns 365. All right, uh, quickie timeout, come back. We're going to put a bow on the show here on Burns 365.